When I traveled to India about 20 years ago, I took the bus or the coach to travel from one city to another. It was a night bus, so I slept through most of the ride. It was dark, and the road was surrounded by a forest. The road was only illuminated by the headlights of the bus, and we were seemingly alone on the road. I woke up for a brief moment and just stared out the window. There, I saw this creature on the side of the road hurrying into the dark woods. The moment only lasted a second or two, but I saw this creature so clearly. It looked like something with a human body doing an inverted crab walk. It had the head of a Doberman pincher or a jackal, and it had a kind of waddling gait with each limb moving independently. Everybody around me was asleep and I felt like a crazy person. I just kept telling myself that I must have seen something else and misinterpreted it in my mind. I just caught a glimpse of it. And years later, I questioned whether I was dreaming it. I feel extremely certain of what I saw, but I'm probably wrong. In fact, there's actually probably a logical explanation. Again, what I saw looked very jackal-like in the head. I'm a very rational person, and I do not believe in supernatural things, but being in an Indian forest at night will make even the most sane person doubt his mind. Those forests are truly scary. When I was younger, I used to routinely sneak out of the house at night to meet up with friends and perform acts of minor mischief and light vandalism. One of the newer additions to the group lived a little out of the way, but we were always game to pick him up because it meant crossing through the tall grasses of a farm that stood between his and our corner of suburbia. One crisp, cool autumn evening, we had concluded our business of hopping a pool fence and rearranging the poolside furniture, which was scandalous, and most of the other teens had gone home for the evening. So, I decided to walk my buddy home. We cut through the tall grasses in the farm and took a seat in the middle of them by a tree that had a series of small boulders that was made ideal for sitting. We talked the usual teenage angsty crap. Who liked who? What were you going to do when you grew up? Who was going to move out first to escape their oppressive suburban life first? There was a lull in conversation and I remember hearing a dog barking in the distance by the nearby farmhouse. I glanced up, and looming over the tall grass were three person-shaped forms, not together, not moving, spread several hundred feet apart in the field, stock still. To clarify, this was a field of grass, no scarecrows, no trees, save the one, and nothing that could realistically make these shapes. I froze up and looked over to my friend shakily asking if he could see it. I didn't clarify because he gave a terrified nod. None of the figures moved an inch, indistinct and shadowy. They remained exactly rooted to the spot, and we were absolutely petrified. Then, closer than close, the insisting low growling of a dog no less than 10 feet away from us, somewhere in the grass, right on top of us. We both got up and bolted, but nothing chased after, not the dog, not the figures, and we have no idea what made that growling. As I stood huddled with my friend, hiding behind a car on a suburban street, the moon tucked behind a cloud formation that cast a small pale thread of light down only on us. I believed in things more, like the supernatural, the unexplained. I stayed at my friend's house for as long as it took for us to think of a reasonable explanation to what we'd seen. I had to get home, and the only real way back was through that field. Plus, we had to prove it to ourselves. Prove to ourselves that it had been trees we'd failed to notice, or scarecrows that had been put up for autumn. Anything at all. We came back to the field, armed with aluminum baseball bats for self-defense and shakily stepped back into the area with the one tree and the standing stones.
and surveilled the field. Nothing. The horizon was completely constant. Tall grass, no shadows, no shapes, no trees, no scarecrows, and certainly no dog. Nothing to explain what we'd seen, and nothing to stop me from bolting across the property, terrified out of my mind. No one believes what we saw and what we say we saw, or think we're blowing it out of proportion. That grass was around head high, around six feet, and the stationary figures we saw had easily two feet over the grass. I didn't sleep well that night, and while I mostly put it out of my mind, I won't forget it. The farm was sold off and turned into a development not long after I moved away, and some nights I can't help but think that I hope they did not build near the standing stones. I know it reads like a fake story, but I lived it, and only the friend that I lived it with believes me to this day. This was back in my college days. At the time, I was a mess. I had gotten kicked out of the dorm I was living in at the time because I was just a drunken jerk, and so I lost those privileges pretty quickly. So, my only resort was to stay with a buddy who lived about 15 miles away from my college campus. Yeah, it wasn't the most ideal situation, but I was very humble, fortunate, and safe that he let me stay in his spare bedroom, rent free for the time being, mind you. Yeah, we're still good friends to this day, and he's really been there for me. But this happened to me during my stay there. It only happened once, but it was enough to scare the crap out of me. One night, I want to say it was early in the springtime, because I only stayed there for about four months before I moved out again. So again, it was early spring, and I was just settling into bed, so probably about one in the morning. I was a night owl, don't judge me. As I feel myself drifting off to sleep, I get this overwhelming sensation that somebody's in the room staring at me. You know how when you're in that half state of sleep and being awake? That's kind of how I was. I felt myself drifting off to sleep, but I still felt aware of the things going on around me. The feeling grew in intensity over the course of a matter of seconds. I sat up quickly, scanned the room, only to find nothing. But then I heard a tapping sound at the window, which I turned my attention and saw what initially somebody trying to prank me in a werewolf mask and costume. I smirked at first, but then I studied the face of this thing, and within seconds, my smirk turned into a frown, and that's when I felt my stomach knot up. What I was looking at wasn't a person in a costume, nor was it a mask. This wasn't some clever prop either. This was a real creature. I don't think it was a werewolf, I guess, but it certainly looked like a wolf. At least it resembled that. The tapping sound I had heard that initially turned my attention towards the window was it putting its large hand on the glass. I say hand because it had five fingers, long black claws that were attached to each fingertip, and it gave me the most intense stare. It was a deep stare, deep into my eyes, almost like it was looking into my soul. I felt that this thing, whatever it was, was definitely not a person. I don't normally believe in supernatural things, but the energy this thing gave off, it felt entirely demonic. I don't know if this was a demon or what, but after staring intently at me through the window for about 10 seconds, although in the moment it felt like 10 whole minutes, it just backed away from the window, turned, and walked off. Afterwards, I was so terrified, I jumped up out of bed, ran out my door, only to be greeted by strange looks from my friend, who was sitting in the living room, smoking hookah. He kind of looked puzzled, as why I looked so freaked out and panicked, and in my boxers, running out of my bedroom. He asked, is everything okay? And I told him what I saw, and what was outside the window, he told me I should probably go back to sleep, and that I was just in a dreamlike state. But I swear that this really happened. I promise that what I saw was not just a work of the mind. This was a living being, or I assume so. It was flesh and blood. 
That much I can guarantee. I saw it with my own eyes. There's no mistaking that. It was as real as real life can get. I figured he wouldn't believe me. So I went back into my bedroom and just stayed up the rest of the night, hoping this thing wouldn't return. That was the only time in my entire life that I've ever dealt with anything of the paranormal supernatural realm. And even today, I'm still kind of a skeptic, but I do know that there's bad and good out there. And whatever this thing was, it was definitely in the realm of evil. It was Halloween night. I was in seventh grade, getting ready to go trick-or-treating with my friends. We lived in a small town that bordered between suburban and rural, so our journey would consist of traveling across property, widespread neighborhoods in order to get our candy. I was at my friend's house, we'll call her Caitlin, waiting for the other two to show up. Since our group consisted of two boys and two girls, we thought it'd be fun to go with Scooby-Doo, or at least the Scooby-Doo gang, I should say. I was Velma, Caitlin was Daphne. My other friends, whom we'll call Alex and Josh, dressed as Shaggy and Fred. We even planned on bringing Josh's Great Dane with us so she could be Scooby. But his mom wasn't really cool with that. Looking back now, I understand. I wouldn't trust a bunch of 12 year olds with the responsibility of handling a massive dog for hours upon hours either. Josh showed up at around 4.30. Alex arrived about 15 minutes after him. We were out the door a bit before 5. At what I guess was around 6.30, Alex stopped moving after we finished our most recent house. I asked him what was wrong and he said he felt like we were too old to be doing this, and that it felt a bit lame. I asked if he had any better ideas. As it turned out, he did. Since we lived in the South, we had a legend of haunted woods nearby. Allegedly, they were filled with the ghosts of slaves who had been hung there. Before I could even make a decision on whether or not I wanted to go, my two other friends agreed. It was dark by now, and we started heading our way towards the woods. We began to stray further and further away from the light that the street lamps provided us, and I wasn't as scared of ghosts as much as I was paranoid about getting lost. We had brought a couple of flashlights with us, so we'd be able to see. But entering in an old area, tall trees all around, you can make a group of kids easily get confused on what direction they were really headed. We tread through the woods, not really finding anything significant. Josh decided to call out for the ghosts, and Caitlin, who was horribly superstitious, told him to stop, and then if the spirits were to talk to us, they needed to come on their own accord and not be disturbed. I was just getting bored, and part of me wanted to make an excuse that I was scared so we can go back to trick-or-treating. Then, in the distance, we heard the sounds of twigs breaking and leaves being crunched under somebody's feet. We followed the noises to check out what was going on. Well, as it turned out, it was just a doe, and she ran off as soon as she came into the line of sight. However, she led us to something much more interesting. In the distance, we could make out the shape of a large old abandoned house. It was in very bad shape, though, to the point where most of the roof had collapsed in on itself. Alex mentioned how it must have been a plantation at one point in time, and if that was the case, we were probably in the most haunted area the woods could offer. So, in response, Josh called out for the spirits again. We heard what sounded like a brick being dropped onto the ground. It was only then did I start to get scared. Josh seemed excited and began to move closer to the house. We followed with great hesitance on my part. We shone our flashlights into the house, but nothing was to be seen. Josh called out once more, asking if the spirit was a slave. That's when we heard a deep, low, grumbling growl. Caitlin began to panic at this point, saying there was a demon here and that we needed to get out as soon as possible. Before we knew it, 
we saw a pair of two glowing red eyes appear from the dark. We all began to book, screaming as we made our way back into the woods. I don't want to be alone, so I just followed Alex wherever he was going. I had no idea where Josh and Caitlin were. I heard Caitlin screaming in the distance, so I called out for her, but she didn't respond, just continued to scream. I then looked around, realizing I had lost track of Alex. I didn't have either flashlight, so I couldn't make out anything but trees around me. I then heard footsteps running my way, and I was about to take off before I realized it was just Caitlin. She was full on bawling and said we had to go. Some feet away, I can make out the red glowing eyes once again. We sprinted and I trailed behind her, taking a moment to look back, just to see what the thing looked like. I didn't know what I expected, but it didn't look ghostly at all. In fact, the closest thing I could narrow it down to was a werewolf, as it had a vaguely human shape and was standing up on its two legs. But its overall appearance was that of a dog's. It was huge, at least three times the size of Josh's Great Dane. I know that sounds preposterous, but I promise, this thing was massive. Part of me wondered if this was just some elaborate costume or prank, but I know this thing looked far too real for that to be the case. The texture of its fur, the faint supernatural glow of its eyes, and the way its body moved when it breathed, all seemed too evident toward its authenticity. This was a living, wild beast. It began to walk towards us, and I continued to sprint, changing directions, hoping to lose this thing. It worked, but I had no idea where Caitlin went. I hid behind a tree, trying my best to quiet my gasps for air. Through the moonlight that made its way through the trees along with the glowing of the animal's eyes, I could spot it stopping in its tracks before going down onto all fours, seemingly trying to sniff out an area for who could be nearby. It moved its head in my direction, and I swore for a moment that we met eyes. I ducked back behind the tree as best I could. I heard this dog shuffle around and let out another low growl, seemingly knowing I was there. I wanted to cry, but I was too scared of making any more noise. Then, I heard the sound of an engine roar nearby, and it wasn't long before a car with bright lights came zooming past the trees. It was enough to startle the dog creature and make it run back in the direction it came, or so I thought. Knowing I was near the road, I went past the trees and onto the pavement, waving my hands around to try and get the attention of whatever upcoming drivers I could. I heard a quiet, There's Maggie! come from the distance, and Josh and Alex approached me, asking where Caitlin was. I answered that she was just with me, but I couldn't find her. We heard more twigs snapping and a screech come from the woods, so loud that it echoed into the entire sky. It was followed by Caitlin's scream. Alex flagged down the next car and we called for Caitlin as we climbed in, keeping the doors open so she could hear us. Her screams got closer and closer until she finally appeared from the woods and leapt into the car atop of me and Josh. We slammed in the car and slammed the door shut and demanded the driver to go. This dog creature, I don't even know what you'd call it, leapt out of the woods, standing in plain sight, fully exposed by the car's brake lights. It was even more terrifying now, having a clear view of it and being up close. We all turned around and saw this thing's ferocity on its face. We all screamed and the driver took off. This creature got back down on all fours and began chasing after us, the driver hitting the accelerator so hard that the entire car was vibrating. Eventually though, it was speedy enough to make it far away from that dog thing and I watched out the back window as the figure disappeared back into the darkness the only sight being its glowing red eyes growing smaller and smaller. Now, I don't know if this thing purposefully stopped following us because I felt like it was large enough and powerful that it easily could have kept up with our car if it really wanted to. The driver asked us what the hell just happened and we replied that we didn't know. 
He said that as soon as we got to his house, he was going to phone the police. Upon arriving, we waited on the couch, not knowing what to do. We didn't talk about it at all. In fact, none of us wanted to. While waiting for the police to arrive, the driver let us take turns calling our parents and letting them know what happened. None of us tried to give too many details. For the most part, our parents were angry that we wandered off from our destination. My folks told me that I'd be getting a stern talk once I got home, which I knew was just code word for being grounded. The police arrived, we made our statements, and not much happened after that, except our parents coming to pick us up. Like I predicted, I was grounded, but my parents were mostly just glad that I was safe. Some years after the event, Caitlin and I were discussing that night. We decided to go back to the woods after school, while it was still light out, just to see if it was still there. I think by this point, we'd rationalized that it was just a guy pulling a prank, considering I heard nothing new come about after speaking to the police. Caitlin and I weren't friends with Josh and Alex anymore. It wasn't anything too serious. It was just that we naturally drifted apart over time. They had their group of guy friends and were doing their own thing now. So, it was just me and her. Since we were old enough to drive at this point, we took ourselves there, stepping out of the car and quietly walking in the woods. We had cell phones unlike last time, although the service wasn't that great out where we were. Caitlin also had brought her bear spray that she stole from her stepdad. We went back to the place where the plantation house was, and it was in far worse shape than I remembered. In one of the areas where the wall collapsed in on itself, we took a look inside. There wasn't much to see, until I noticed a series of massive paw prints indented into dried mud. Caitlin and I took one look at each other, and although we didn't say anything, we made a mutual agreement. These paw prints were easily double the size of Josh's Great Dane. How do I remember that? Because sometimes, he would walk his Great Dane with us when we'd hang out, and I was always amazed by the size of his dog's paw prints and how large they were. These were easily double that size. They were huge. Even though it was daytime, at this point, we didn't trust that we wouldn't stumble upon something that we shouldn't. So, we walked away from the site, went back through where we came from, and drove off. I've since moved pretty far away from there, but last I heard, that whole house was properly torn down a couple of years after I graduated high school. I find it almost funny, reflecting back on it now, because the only reason we'd ever gone into those woods in the first place was to find spirits that lurked the plantation. Little did we know, we'd stumble across something far, far worse. I don't believe in werewolves, but I can't deny that this creature didn't resemble that, straight out of something that you'd expect to see out of a movie. Now, I can't really tell a lot of people about this because they won't believe me, and will write it off as just a ghost story, or some sort of scary story. But I and my friends will always live with this true encounter, of some sort of creature that we witnessed. In the early spring of 2017, I was on my way to a doctor appointment at about 10 a.m. and traveling a back road as I like to drive and see the sights and be relaxed while driving. I'm from the country up here in northeastern Ohio in the middle of the primary snow belt so I can drive anything in any kind of terrain, but it's nice just to see the countryside when you're driving. So, I took a back road this time. I had driven about 25 miles and came upon a field where corn was growing and there were still some old stalks sticking up in the field. The corn fields were on both sides of the highway and I like to drive slower to see deer and hawks and other different kinds of animals. It's peaceful and relaxing, and nature always has a way of putting my mind at ease and in awe. Once, I saw a big bald eagle on the stretch of highway standing in the middle of the road, eating some roadkill. So, I came to a stop and watched it for nearly a minute before it even realized I was there, 
and then it flew away. But this particular day, I had only seen some scattered Canadian geese in the cornfields. Still, I kept looking with a watchful eye, as I am legally deaf and must be extremely alert while driving. The cornfields end abruptly as thick woodline moved right up to the road, and then, a few hundred feet further along, it receded back some 300 or 400 yards, and the cornfields were there again. This was a beautiful day, and I could see everything perfectly clear. The sky was a beautiful blue, with just light, wispy rain clouds, moving slowly inwards, and the trees still didn't have any leaves on them yet. Suddenly, a tall, thin, black, four-legged animal, way off in the distance, caught my eye, so I slowed way down. I was the only person on the road at the moment, and I wanted to get a good look at the animal at the edge of the thick wood line. As I sized it up and came to understand that it was a huge black wolf with long, skinny legs, thick chest, and skinnier abdomen, I saw its head turn my direction, and it looked right at me. Even from that distance, there was no mistaking those glowing yellow eyes. Its ears were tall, and they had tufts of fur on top, like you would see on a bobcat's ears. Immediately, something like a shudder of amazement and fear rang throughout my entire body, and I was totally mesmerized. I nearly crashed from not being able to take my eyes off it, but somehow, my instincts took over, and I escaped the telephone pole that I was headed directly for. I don't recall ever taking my eyes off the giant wolf, but I must have because I swerved the truck and missed the pole. That creature had the fiercest look on its face, and it struck me as not being a normal wolf at all. If I had to guess, I would say that on all fours, its shoulder was over three feet high, and its huge head must have been close to five feet in the air from the ground. Its torso was thin, and the musculature of this animal could clearly be seen from even 300 or so yards away. There was no way in my mind that this could have been your average wolf, or even a hybrid being that huge. Its body was long, if I had a guess. I would say this animal standing upright on two feet was probably close to eight feet tall, from the top of its head to the ground. I've seen some pretty big wolves in videos on TV, but nothing quite like that. After the doctor's appointment, I began an internet search for wolves that size when I got home and found nothing that would indicate even a hybrid wolf that size. But I did find a local report from an area of town about 15 miles south of that area that was totally bizarre. A deer hunter in the town of Niles, Ohio had gone missing in late 2016. A search and rescue team found a dismembered body about half a mile behind the Niles police station and parts of the body were strewn along over a distance of nearly two miles, as if something had ripped this poor man to shreds and dragged pieces of his body down into the timbers near a lake with the intent of eating it at a later point in time. The police blamed a dominant male black bear for the atrocity, and eventually they found and shot a big male black bear, and that was the end of it. But let me tell you what I know. If a black bear attacks you, it means to kill you, so you must fight back if you intend to live through it. The report that was made said that the police stated that it was likely that the bear had snuck up on the man and downed him from behind so that he had minimal chances of fighting it off. And all of this took place on the ground because the hunter never actually made it to a stand. But I know the black bears in this area and they have never attacked a human being in this manner. In fact, Northeastern Ohio has never had a black bear kill a human in my entire life, and I'm 57 years old. The evidence clearly suggests that something considerably more powerful attacked this hunter from behind and got the jump on him. Over 99% of all deer hunters in this country are so aware of their surroundings while traversing to their tree stand that the tiniest twig breaking grabs their attention. So there's almost no way that this man didn't know that something was creeping up behind him, especially a bear of all things. This was definitely the work of something quite large and powerful, 
and definitely not a black bear. Bears bury their kills and come back for it later. And this poor man, who was positively identified as the missing hunter, was found torn to shreds and his body parts spread abroad over a distance of nearly two whole miles. Anyone else suspect a dogman like I do? And I believe that I saw that animal just a few months later on my way to the doctor's office. This is a true story. It really happened and is still unsolved to this day, some four and a half years later. The report about this is no longer available, unfortunately. I have tried to find it recently so that I could send this story and other channels to help people become aware that these creatures actually exist, but we are intentionally being kept in the dark about their existence. For what reasons, I'm not sure. This was back in 2007, when my son had just turned 22 and was having a drunken night over at his friend's house. At the time, he didn't have a car and he most certainly didn't have a license. So, it was up to dear old dad to come pick him up because he had to work early the next day. I mean, hey, that's what dads are for and I loved my son that I would go do anything. Well, his buddy, whom he's been friends with since he was 13, decided to have a drunken night out at his friend's place. His friend lived quite a ways out there, out in the back country, which meant me driving early in the morning through lots of winding, dark roads with no light. Not that I've had a problem with those things, but again, I didn't really know these roads very well, so they kind of put me on edge, so to speak. It's not that they creep me out, it's just that I don't have the greatest of vision, and I'm not the best nighttime driver. I never have been. I'm not a fan of poor visibility driving, but it is what it is, and I had to go pick up my son. But that's not what this story is about. I'm just trying to give you some information detailing the beginning of the story. Anyway, it's about one in the morning, and my son needs me to pick him up from his friends. He's heavily intoxicated, and he has to be at work at six in the morning. He figured it would be better to get at least some sleep than no sleep. So I'm on my way there. I probably have about 15 minutes till I get to him, when something huge steps onto the side of the road to my right. I didn't see it at first until my headlights hit it. The first thing I noticed was two glowing orange-yellow orbs, or so I would call them. It turns out they were eyes atop this massive dog werewolf looking thing. I say thing because creature isn't the right word. It sounds too fictitious. I didn't see it move, but I just partially saw it standing there, and my headlights lit it up enough that I got kind of the details that I needed to see, just to determine what it was I was looking at. This thing full on looked like somebody in a huge werewolf costume that stood about eight to nine feet tall. Its head, or whatever it was, was well above the height of my small sedan. I don't know if this was some clever prop that somebody stuck on the side of the road, but either way, it gave me the creeps, but I tried not to think too much about it. As I drove by it, I kind of tried to dismiss it. Like, did I really just see that? Is that really what was there? Or was I just seeing things? I mean, it looked pretty real, but again, I would like to just think that it was some sort of prop that somebody stuck there. I didn't see anything move, I didn't see it jump across the road, I just looked up and I saw my headlights hit its eyes, which, God, I think back to that now, and I hope it was some smart reflectors stuck in the prop of some Hollywood object that somebody cleverly stuck out there in the trees to scare oncoming drivers, because had that thing been real, I don't even want to go there. That's like going into my nightmares. Look, I know my story's not really that scary, and it's only mildly interesting at best, but it's the only weird thing I've ever had happen. It's the only sighting, I guess you could even call it a sighting, if really anything, that I could not explain what it was. I'd like to logically think and break it down to it being a Hollywood prop, but then I think about it. Who would set up a nine foot tall Hollywood werewolf prop on the side of a two lane highway? I don't know. After I picked up my son, I took a different road back to our house, so I didn't drive that same road again so I wasn't able to see if it was there. 
and even though I have driven that road since, it was probably another four months until I would drive that same road again, in which that thing, or what I would assume to be the prop, was gone. But then again, that could have just been the fact that whoever put it there, moved it. So really, I don't know what to believe. I want to believe that it was a prop, and wasn't real. But I guess I can never be too sure. From what I saw, or the glimpse of what I saw, it looked pretty realistic. But then again, aren't props supposed to? I'm curious to see what you think. What do you believe that I saw that night? When I was in my 20s, one of my buddies had left town for the weekend. He was a single guy who lived alone in a tiny house that backed up to some woods and needed somebody to watch Baxter, a little black kitten he had just adopted. For two months prior, my buddy had been working at a local farm and Baxter was a part of the litter that one of the barn cats had given birth to. He was the runt, and his mother often ignored him on top of his siblings, pushing him out of the way when it came to nurse. So, he was left neglected, malnourished, and partially starving. My buddy, who's always been an animal lover, and too sympathetic for his own good, decided to take Baxter home and nurse him back to health. This worked, however, Baxter had caught an infection which would require him to take medicine three times a day. This would otherwise be fine if my friend didn't have a family emergency that required him to skip town for a bit. On top of that, the medicine had to be dispensed a few hours before or after Baxter ate. So my buddy asked me to house it and take care of Baxter in exchange for some money. I was also single disconnected from my family, and struggling with unemployment, so I had no financial support system in place. I definitely needed the extra cash. So, I agreed. Despite the short notice, of course. He gave me a piece of paper indicating when to feed Baxter and when to give him his medicine. He also told me not to let Baxter outside, that he had a tendency of trying to escape it seemed easy enough, and as my buddy had cable, I could just keep myself entertained while staying at his house for the day. The first few hours of the house were pretty uneventful. The most exciting thing was the task of trying to get Baxter to take his meds. It was in liquid form that came in a syringe, and I had to dispense it in his mouth. If you've ever owned a pet, you'd know how much of a pain in the butt they can be when it comes to that kind of stuff. Still, I managed to make it work, and I fed him three times a day that my friend asked me to. Most of the time, I just watched TV, while Baxter slept on my lap. I'm not too much of an animal person myself, but given the Baxter I had heard about him, I figured I should let him have the attention that he was deprived of back at the farm. After giving Baxter his last dose of medicine, Right around 9 p.m., I decided to call it a night. I'd be back in the morning, so it wasn't like he was going to be left alone for a super long time. I opened the door to leave when I felt Baxter's fur brush up against my legs as he sprinted out the door, and given he had dark fur, I wasn't able to see where he'd run off at first. I didn't have a flashlight or anything of the likes so I followed him to the best of my ability into the woods. There, I had lost sight of him completely. I walked around, putting my hands around my mouth as I called for him. I didn't even know if he knew his name yet. I heard some hissing and low meows come from the distance, the noises only getting louder and louder as they went on. I jogged towards them, stopping to find two pairs of glowing eyes staring at me. The first were clearly from Baxter. They appeared to be high up in a tree branch and were pretty small. The other, though, were all still high up, were much bigger. It took a moment for my eyes to adjust in order to make out the figure that belonged to them, and at first, my brain couldn't make sense of what it was. 
I'd never seen an animal like that in my life. As funny as it sounds, even though it was anything but hilarious in that moment, its body resembled that of a wrestler, or even a bodybuilder. Its spine had a nearly C-shaped curvature to it, and its arms stretched high above its head as its gigantic claws gripped the tree that Baxter was in. Its head didn't match its human-like figure at all. It was simply that of a dog's. The monster had quickly lost interest in Baxter and directed its attention now towards me. Going back down on all fours, and though there wasn't much light, I was able to make out the deep scratches it had made in the tree that it had taken hold of. I didn't even have the time to scream and found myself running for my life before I even knew it. I had gotten back to the house, locking the door behind me and pushing a nearby shelf in front of it. I then went to the back door, panicking, which was already locked and also blocked it with furniture nearby. I paced around, trying to make sense of what had just happened. I peeked out a window, but there was nothing in sight and I wondered if the thing even bothered to chase me in the first place. Did I just dream this whole thing? Was I sleeping and this was a nightmare? I knew Baxter was probably dead by now, or at least he would be soon, and I knew my buddy was going to kill me if that was the case. Somehow, I didn't think he would believe me if I told him that there was some sort of hellish-looking creature lurking in the woods behind his house. He'd been living there for three years and never spoke anything about the sort. Although I appeared to be safe, I didn't feel comfortable even going outside to leave in my car. So I spent the night in the house. I somehow managed to fall asleep. When I awoke the next morning, I pondered on whether I should try and look for Baxter. He was probably dead, and the creature from the night before was still in there. But at the same time, I didn't know how my buddy would react to such an event like losing Baxter. I ultimately decided I'd look for him, but only got so many yards into the woods before giving up and turning back. I wasn't going to put myself in unnecessary danger for just a cat. I moved the furniture back and went to search for Baxter. I called out for him, and to my pleasant surprise, I heard him meowing. I followed the meows, and he was still up in the tree that I had found him in last night. I was more easily able to see the scratch marks in the bark now, and they were even longer and deeper than I'd ever remembered. They seemed to be more closely resembling gashes, and a shiver went down my spine just upon the sight of it. I then noticed paw prints on the ground, most of them leading back into the deeper section of woods. As quietly as I could not to attract any attention from the beast, I encouraged Baxter to come back down from the tree. It took a couple of minutes, but eventually he complied, and I carried him back to the house, pacing my walk as fast as I could. I fed him and thought about what to do next. Ultimately, I ended up packing up his food and medicine and brought him back to my apartment. My landlord did not allow animals, so I had to be careful when it came to getting him in. I gave him some newspaper to use as a litter box, but the damn thing pissed on the floor anyway. I just kept him in the bathroom for most of the time after that, and fed him, and gave him his medicine at the time that it said the previous day. Once it was time for my buddy to come back home, I took Baxter back to the house, and instead of leaving, decided to wait for my friend. Once he entered the house, he seemed surprised to see I'd stuck around, but wasn't unwelcoming or anything. I gave him a few minutes to wind down and settle in, before letting him know the events that unfolded just a couple of days prior. He was mostly just confused, and asked if I was sure that it wasn't just a wild dog. I told him I was certain. He shrugged, and said he was glad that I got Baxter back, and then gave me my cash. I figured it wasn't my problem anymore, and just went home. Well, a little under a year later, Baxter went missing again. He'd snuck out of the house at night when the back door was left ajar. 
It didn't shock me, to say the least. He was born on a farm after all, and the outdoors were his calling. Even if the outdoors had all sorts of predators lurking in the woods, some more terrifying than others. A few days passed and Baxter never came home. I helped my buddy put up missing cat posters, but deep in my heart, I already knew what had happened. My buddy was in denial and he would spend a lot of time in his woods searching for his cat. It wasn't until he himself saw the same hunched over figure of the canine-like creature lurking in between the trees in the distance did he realize I wasn't lying. I just wanted to tell him I told you so, but he was grieving with the loss of a pet on top of all the other crap going on in his life. He sold the house eventually and moved in with me, which was helpful because even though since I'd gotten a job, it was just barely enough money to keep my head above the water. My landlord also amended the rules and began allowing pets, with a fee, of course. It wasn't long before another cat made its way into our apartment. My place wasn't anywhere near the woods, but my friend and I were both extremely careful to make sure our new cat didn't get anywhere outside the apartment. I still wasn't much of an animal person, and I still am not, but with that dog creature's gigantic claws that were practically kitchen knives and teeth I could only presume were equally as heinous, I can only imagine the fate that must have met Baxter. I couldn't allow another creature to experience a gruesome death again. I didn't know whether I was too big a prey for the thing to hunt upon. I would be surprised if I was, given that thing had to be a good nine or ten feet tall. But I found myself feeling grateful that I managed to escape. My luck ended there though. For years, I had nightmares filled with vivid depictions of becoming a victim to this thing. I'd have dreams where my innards were ripped out and my neck was crushed within its jaws. The worst part though, was that my buddy also had nightmares, except I was still the one being killed in them. He said that he could only stand there and watch. I'm not particularly religious or anything, but I do sometimes wonder if something watching over me spared me of that fate. Or maybe I just simply slipped through the cracks, and Baxter was the second best thing.